The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, today we're going to talk about basic pump maintenance, but wanted to get a little bit of housekeeping items out of the way before we get started. Uh, probably the most frequent question that we get when we do these webinars is, are attendees able to get a copy of the presentation? And the answer to that question is an, an emphatic yes, absolutely. Uh, at the conclusion of the webinar, you'll receive an email um, from us. Simply respond to that email if you wish to get a copy of the presentation, and I will send that out to you um, very, very quickly. Also, uh, if anybody you know happens to miss the webinar and still wants to view it, this will be up on our YouTube page uh, within likely the next 24 to 48 hours. So uh, if anybody happens to miss it, we can always have them take a look at that recording. Uh, but with that being said, I'd like to introduce Wade Heisler, TPC Tranco instructor uh, who specializes in mechanical, and he's going to bring us through the wonderful world of basic pump maintenance. Good morning. So that being said, welcome to uh, basic pump maintenance uh, on a, in the wide, wide world of pumps. Um, we tend to, in our facilities, kind of uh, ignore the pumps until they become a problem. Um, so, you know, the topic that we got showing up here on the top page here, basic pump maintenance, trying to keep a problem from happening in the first place. Um, as we go along, like John said, my name's Wade Heisler. I'm a mechanical instructor for TPC Trainco. Uh, I've been doing this for quite a while. Um, I spent some time working for a quaint metropolitan maintenance supply organization, uh, technical support and pumps and plumbing. Um, I was also a maintenance instructor for United Airlines for 13 years. I did everything but airplanes. So if you can imagine um, things that take place or things that happen at a an airport facility, uh, my specialty while I was at uh, United Airlines was uh, uh, I taught uh, de-icers and de-icing equipment, so that got into glycol mixing and all that kind of fun stuff. So uh, been around a lot of pumps, seen a lot of problems, um, and uh, one of the things I learned over the years is that people tend to uh, ignore my pump or ignore our pumps until they really start giving us problems. So um, that being said, I understand you guys are all here to try to find out some mysteries of what happens inside my pump and why the heck did it just decide to crap out today on me. Um, so uh, as John points out here, and I don't know if John's going to jump in and say a bunch of things for us, but uh, TPC training systems were kind of, uh, like it says here, we're the leader in industrial training. We offer a great lineup of training solutions to help build a better, safer, more efficient workforce. And um, I actually work for uh, TPC Train Trainco. Um, I do some work for TPC I schematic. I do some mechanical reviews of drawings and such and stuff like that. So uh, I basically teach pumps and pump maintenance, uh, pumping systems. I teach hydraulics. Uh, I also teach uh, generators and emergency power systems. It's on the mechanical side of the world. So um, it's kind of fun. I, I get to meet a lot of fun people. I get to see a lot of things. So anyway, what we do at Trainco specifically in an open seminar is we kind of cover the generics. However, uh, if you should select us to do an on-site, we can specify and drill down and be more specific to the equipment in your facility. Um, point out some things uh, to help you avoid problems in the future. Uh, point out some things that might kind of point out what you can do to improve your maintenance on your pumps, uh, how to prevent problems from occurring. Okay, so while this is all going on, you might want to just think about some questions to throw out there at the end of this thing. We'll be here to answer as many as we possibly can. Um, and uh, so, as far as uh, TPC Train Co. goes, we offer a lot of courses on different types of mechanical and electrical products. So that being said, um, looking at our training 
solutions, uh, the better, safer, more efficient. Um, as far as in the industrial mechanical side, um, I think safety is probably the most important thing when working around any type of a piece of equipment. So our emphasis on safety and understanding and where to find that information uh, while you're out there trying to figure out what's going on. So, let's see here, come on. There we go. So, when we start to look at pumps in particular in our facilities, we, uh, I always ask the question, what type of pump is it you have? What is it doing, okay? Uh, on the far left-hand side, you'll see a, a rather large white pump in the picture there. And I was kind of remiss when I took that picture because standing next to it, my head was just about underneath that Alice Chalmers logo there in the picture. I don't know if you can see that there, make that out. So this is quite a large pump. And when I ask the question, what's this pump doing? Um, this pump is actually uh, one of two pumps uh, on a waste treatment facility out in California. And uh, just to give you some kind of an idea, this thing pumps somewhere in the near neighborhood of about eh, 186 to 196,000 gallons an hour. Uh, it was a, a mixed flow pump. It pumps effluent. So it's bringing the inbound sewage into the facility and spreading it around. Um, very low RPMs, very old pump actually. So when somebody ever asks the question, how long does my pump last? Well, I like to show this picture because this pump was installed somewhere in the neighborhood of about 1958-59. And they've done very little maintenance to it other than uh, some, uh, obviously some bearing work and some seal work. But, you know, in that amount of time, that's, that's pretty exceptional service. And then we go all the way down to the smaller pump that you see in the next picture, that little Aurora pump. Um, the two tags that you see, the one that's on the pump and the one that's in the picture to the right, those are not the same pumps. But, you know, this is a, a relatively new pump in an installation. It's a vertical uh, stack pump. It has several little impellers underneath there. And it's in the application of doing a, a fire, a fire suppression system. It's uh, maintaining, it's the jockey pump and the fire, protect, fire uh, prevention system. And uh, later on, as we go on through the presentation here, uh, I'm gonna point out some things that are very, very important in, in your facility uh, that if you haven't done it yet, uh, with the day and the age that we have with the modern cell phone service and such, uh, we all got, we're all carrying around little microcomputers on our hips. Um, I always tell people, if you get the opportunity, take a picture of that pump tag. Uh, reason why I ask that question is, have you got a picture of your pump tag? Do you know what your pump is? Those kind of scenarios. Um, if you have an opportunity to take a picture of your pump tag when it's in the condition it is, you see in the picture there, uh, the, the third one from the left. Uh, this comes in very handy because chances are in your facility somewhere along the line, you might have uh, the uh, the opportunity to send in what I call the pump, the uh, painting ninjas. And those are the guys that go in and paint everything, including all the pump tags. Um, so it's always a good idea to take a picture of that some way, shape, how, but leave it attached to the pump. Uh, I've seen in a lot of facilities where uh, particular customers will actually take and remove that tag and put it in a file and then the file cabinet gets moved and they can't find the pump tag. And then they need support or they need help or they need parts trying to figure out why the pump's not working. And without the pump tag, you're kind of only guessing what's going on with this pump. So this is probably one of the most important pieces of information in your facility that you should kind of keep what I say, keep holy, uh, keep it in a good place so you can find it. Uh, the information that's on there will help you get parts. Um, it'll help the maintenance people troubleshoot it. Um, it'll tell you exactly what it is, what it should be doing. So all those kind of fun things. Now, uh, as far as uh, pumps that are kind of unique to their application, the one that's on the far right-hand side is actually a fire pump. Um, and everybody says, well, why is a fire pump so much different than any other pump that I ever see? Well. Fire pumps are typically there to 
only run when the fire suppression system is needed. So usually it's when your building's on fire. And unfortunately, this is one of those pumps that tends to have a lot of maintenance done on them because individual insurance companies, local codes, uh, in, internal building uh, requirements require this pump to be tested and inspected on an annual basis. And some people will always say to me, they go, how come my fire pump has to have so much maintenance done on it? And I guess the answer to that one is, is because you want it to work when, when the place is on fire. <laughs> you know, you don't get the luxury of saying, oh, darn, this pump's not working while my building's burning down. Um, so that, keeping that in mind, uh, this is one of those maintenance intensive things. The other thing you'll notice when you see a fire pump, you could actually have this very same pump doing something else in your facility besides fire suppression work. And in that case, it's not going to be painted red. It's going to be painted blue, like you see the pump in the, with the pump tag in the picture on the third one from the left. The, uh, left. Um, fire pumps are typically painted red for a particular reason to denote that they are fire pumps. And uh, the other things you should know about a fire pump is, is you'll never see the word head on the pump tag. Typically, you'll see the gallons per minute and the pressure that it's rated at. Uh, the pump tag that you see there that says Aurora pump, that's actually off of a, uh, a booster pump package in an Air Force base. And um, it's rated at 500 gallons per minute at 170 feet ahead. So when you ask that question, what is head? Head's a dimension. We're going to get into that a little bit later on. Uh, but I like to have the pump tag handy because that tells me where I need to go. So that's one of my most important things. I kind of promote, keep that pump tag in a safe place. Take a picture of it, put it in file, print a bunch of pictures of it, put them in file cabinet someplace in case those pump ninjas get out there and get that pump tag painted. So in our facility, like I said before, a lot of times we don't pay particular attention to the pump because pretty much the pump, if it was put in the correct application, in other words, we had a really good engineer decide what kind of pump we needed for the job that it's doing. So when we're troubleshooting a pump, I always ask the questions. Um, it's basically, you'll notice throughout this whole presentation, I call it the W's of troubleshooting. Um, you say, what is the pump not doing? What is the pump doing? Uh, when I ask what is the pump not doing, uh, typically the first complaint that comes out, they say there's something wrong with the system. It's got to be the pump. Well, uh, when you go to the operator, typically they kind of shrug their shoulders and they say, I don't know, it was working great yesterday and today it's all of a sudden it's not working. Don't know why. So then you call the maintenance people out there and the maintenance people say, okay, well, what's the pump not doing? Why are you calling me? Okay. And when you think about those things, it's actually quite interesting because we tend to ignore that until it's not doing what it's supposed to do. So before we can even begin to troubleshoot this uh, pump, we got to ask the question, what is it doing? And then, of course, later on down the line, if you've got a good pump installation and you've got a suction pressure gauge and you've got a discharge pressure gauge on the pump, I always ask the question, what's the pressure? And of course, right after that, I'm going to ask you what the gallons per minute and the feet ahead are. Because without that information, you have no idea where your pump is hanging out there at. Okay. Um, I have actually gotten into situations where I've gone to troubleshoot a pump. And the question you see down below, it says, is the pump running? <laughs> Well, that's kind of a good question. Sometimes in a facility where there's lots of noise going on, everybody just kind of assume the pump's running. Can I physically tell if the pump's running? How do I tell if the pump's running? Those kind of scenarios. So, and then last but not least, on that whole scenario, what is the pump pumping? Um, most of the times our pumps are there to pump some type of liquid. Um, the definition of that liquid is very important because the specific gravity will affect things. The temperature of that fluid will affect things. Things like that can be brought out. Um, obviously, the, the maintenance personnel, hopefully, that are looking at this pump know what's going on as far as that goes. So 
when we look at our pumps in the pump world, we say, okay, what is the pump running? What's the pressure? What's the head? Uh, what's the pump pumping? Uh, be surprised when they ask that question because everybody goes, well, I'm pumping water and glycol. Okay, so is it cold water and glycol? Is it hot water and glycol? Temperature of what I'm pumping is very important as well. So that being said, these are some of the important questions you should ask when you go into doing what is my pump doing? So when we get into a pump, what does a pump do? Well, a pump op when a pump operates, it performs two functions. First, its centrifugal action creates an area of low pressure at the inlet of the pump which allows the atmospheric pressure that's on us every day to push that fluid from the reservoir into the inlet of the pump. So what I try to get through when we do this basics around the beginning of the class, we talk about pumps don't really suck. Pumps actually create an area of low pressure less than atmospheric. And that allows the gravity that's around us every day to push that fluid into that pump. And the centrifugal action, the second portion of the two functions, takes place. And it's kind of ironic when you think about this, but you remember back when you were a youngster, and I mean a youngster, somewhere around the five, six year old age, when you first got on that merry go round, and you're standing in the middle of that merry go round, and you, all you're doing is getting dizzy. And then as you start to go out further and further to the outside, you feel this energy that's trying to pull you off that little merry-go-round. And then of course you got that 12 or 13 year old bully that's out there. and He's trying to spin that thing so fast, you finally can't hang on anymore and you get thrown off. Well, that's exactly what a, high, that's exactly what a centrifugal pump does. Um, the centrifugal action delivers the pump to the outlet. And there's some things to take into effect there as we go along and think about. It. But basically a pump is a very simple device. And it's one of those simple devices when it acts up, people get all kind of crazy about trying to figure out why it's not doing things. And I've seen a lot of different things, talk to a lot of different uh, people. Uh, and it's interesting to see that when a pump actually fails in my facility, how many red flags it starts popping up. So as we go along there, so. Come on. My program's being a little sluggish here, so. So as we go along, we talk about common pump terminology. This is really kind of fun because when I get into this portion of it, I, you know, I ask the P, I ask the uh, the students when I'm doing the class. Does anybody know what pressure really is? Um, pressure is a resistance to flow. Okay, and in the hydraulic world, uh, pressure is typically in pounds per square inches or PSI. Now, that's not always true because when you go north of the border, sometimes it'll be in bar. If you go across the big pond, they'll actually talk about uh, bar as well. And um, it's kind of funny how we've kind of intermixed some of the metric system in the pumping world as well. So. What I tell people is pressure is the force exerted on a confined liquid, and it acts equally undiminished in all directions. That's part of Blaise Pascal's law. And um, one of the big complaints I hear from customers when they have problems with the pump is they go, oh, my pump's not making enough pressure. <laughs> okay, well, what kind of pressure is it supposed to make? Well, all I know is uh, Ralph, the building manager, when he turned the system over to me, he says, you know, this gauge should read 70 PSI. If it doesn't, you got problems. Well, okay. That might be a good place to start. Uh, been in a lot of mechanical rooms where there's actually a permanent magic marker, you know, permanent markers on the gauge that says uh, the gauge should be in between these two points as you're walking by it. Uh, there's all different kinds of scenarios to uh, what should my pump be doing. When I don't get that pressure, then the question is, is what happened, okay? Typically what pumps do is they generate fluid flow. 
and flow rate is the volume of fluid which passes by a certain point. And in the real wide, wide world of pumps, it's usually represented by the symbol Q when they talk about it. But flow rate is kind of like looking at amperage and current flow on an electrical system. Flow rate is expressed usually in gallons per minute um, in, the, in the centrifugal pump world. In the positive displacement pump world, it could be expressed as in um, ounces per rotation. Uh, there's a lot of different scenarios when you get into pumps. Uh, you can go into gallons per minute, uh, hundreds of gallons per minute, uh, millions of gallons per day, acres feet per day. It's actually kind of interesting how many different ways we can actually determine flow rate of a pump. Uh, for instance, a lot of your waste treatment facilities, they'll tell you, oh, this place handles 165 million gallons a day. Um, it's kind of gets you hard to get your head around that kind of water, but that's a lot, a lot of fluid. So, okay, so next is the word head. Head is actually a measure of work expressed in feet. This is what the pump does. Now, when you think about centrifugal pumps in a facility, pumps are constant head devices. All they do is generate and apply energy to a fluid and make it move. Um, doesn't matter if it's pumping salt water, gasoline, water, water glycol. You know, people call it chiller water. People call it different types of chemicals that we pump in there, sodium hypochloride all this fun stuff that we run across in the day-to-day -day application of what does my pump do. So that head measure work is expressed in feet. And I'll explain how we kind of divide that out there and how that actually works. So the, the, the fourth term standing out here looking at us is density. Density of fluid is its mass per unit of volume and is usually in, expressed as pounds per gallon. Okay, and you everybody says, okay, the density of my water is eight point something pounds. You know, you know they kind of get close to it every time. But in the pumping world, when we're doing troubleshooting, we're actually looking for a cubic foot of water. Okay, a, a unit of measure that's twelve inches by twelve inches by twelve inches. And I'll get into that a little bit later on as well. Now, as we're trying to determine problems with my pump, specific gravity comes into place. Because specific gravity is the ratio of the density of that fluid and everything in the pump world that you see, that gallons per minute, feet of head, that's all out there as based on the specific gravity of water. Water is what we call number one, okay? Water, the specific gravity of water is one. Other fluids, Water and salt water, they're heavier than water, so the specific gravity is much higher. Um, gasoline, as we all know, if you pour water and gas together, the water goes to the bottom because water, gasoline is actually lighter than water, so it tends to float on top of the water. So the specific gravity of gasoline is less. Actually, the specific gravity of gasoline is 0.75. So keeping that in mind, because I can have a pump it'll pump exactly physically a dimension of 100 feet. And if that pump is pumping brine, which is about 1.22, um, the pressure gauge is gonna read about 57 PSI. If that pump is pumping water exactly 100 feet, the pressure at the discharge gauge is gonna read 43 PSI. And if I'm pumping gasoline at 0.75, the pressure gauge is gonna read somewhere around 35, 36 PSI. So it really depends when you're trying to troubleshoot a problem in your facility, what is this pump pumping? So, because specific gravity will change the relationship to the pressure. Um, so I kind of point that out. And I can't tell you the number of times I always get that question. Now there might be a chemist hanging out there to tell you, well, you know, Wade, you're kind of wrong on that one, but. I get guys that ask me, well, what happens if I mix glycol and water together? Well, glycol is a little bit lighter than water, but it tends to be capable of being absorbed into the water, so it mixes. It doesn't really ever stratify, uh, depending on the type of glycol, I guess you put it. But 
the typical glycol that would be put in the cooling system to keep it from freezing and uh, be able to transfer the heat better. It typically takes on the gravity of water. So, okay. So far, so good, I hope. Everybody's having fun here. I'm having fun talking. I'm pretty good at this talking stuff. I can talk to dead people. I'm just, la I'm just kidding. Um, so the pressure exerted on the walls of the container is measured in PSI, okay? Pressure equals force over area. That's a pretty simple statement from before. So, but I go in there and I ask, what is the pressure of the air at sea level? Well, that goes back to the olden days when barometric pressure was out there. We use uh, the barometric pressure of the day. So, because we all know that if the barometric pressure, the weather forecaster comes out and says the barometric pressure is 29.89. I know when you walk out the door at that kind of barometric pressure, you're actually gonna have probably a sunny day, okay? However, if the weather forecaster comes out and says the barometric pressure is 28.3, typically that's going to be the fact we got a low pressure area coming in there and there's going to be clouds and it might even be precipitating, you know, a little rainfall. So the pressure at sea level is 29.92 inches of mercury, or as we like to refer to as 14.7 PSIA. Okay, so the air that we're around every day in our day-to-day -day activity, we've got 14.7 pounds per square inch absolute sitting on top of us. So that would be PSIA. But when I pull that gauge out of the box to put it into that system, it reads zero PSI. Well, that's gauge pressure. So we have to anticipate the fact that most of the time our pump is operating at 14.7 PSIA. That's what makes the water go into the pump, okay? So, like I said, what causes that pressure to change? You got weather, altitude, and vacuum. Now, for those of you who are listening in on this conversation out there, and uh, you might be in a place like uh, Denver, Colorado, well, we're up there at the uh, Mile High City, and the atmospheric pressure there is about 13.3, 13.4, if I remember right off the top of my head. So at 5,000 feet, the atmospheric pressure is less. And I've talked to customers and people who've had pumps operating at higher altitudes than that, and it's even lower. So when we ask about that vacuum, that word vacuum, that's kind of one of those words that's kind of confusing to people because vacuum is actually a measurable pressure, but it's typically anything less than atmosphere is considered vacuum, going back to science 101, okay? So we have weather, altitude, and vacuum which causes that pressure to change out. So we talk about head as a measure of pressure, and it's expressed in feet. You saw that on that pump tag. That pump tag was 170 feet ahead, okay? So at 170 feet ahead, we gotta figure out how do we do the calculation? So one cubic foot of water contains exactly 7.48 gallons weighing in at a hefty 62.3 pounds. Now, when I go through this part of the session, everybody kind of goes, well, you know, a, a foot of water is eight pounds. No, a foot of water is, a cubic foot of water is 12 by 12 by 12. So if you do your math, and you're, if you remember early math, we can take that and we can break that into 144 cubic inches. So what I get out of that big cube is I get a one, one foot by one inch by one inch squared column. And if I take that 62.3 and I divide it by 144, I get that 0 0.432 pounds. And if I want to really know how this whole thing goes, I take that all together and I break it down. I know that one cubic inch of water weighs 0 0.432 pounds. And so if I do a little more science in there and I get into it and I go, well, I need to figure out how much I can get out of that. It takes exactly 2.31 columns of this one by one stacked on top of it to give me one pound of pressure, okay? So one of the hard things to get through 
when you're trying to figure this out is remember, do I divide or do I multiply? Well, if I got the pressure, then I'm going to multiply. If I've got the feet, I'm going to divide. Okay? And if you can remember that, you're halfway through the ball game on this one. So if my pressure gauge in the pump reads 70 PSI roughly, and the pump tag says 165 feet, well, by golly, that pump's got to be doing what it's supposed to be doing. I don't need to go find a flow meter to find out if it's working or not. I can tell by the pressure gauge that that pump is doing exactly what it was designed to do, pump 165 feet ahead. See where I'm going with this whole scenario? A lot of times people think the pump is the problem, but it's really not the pump. It might be the system. So what kind of valve was put in the wrong place? Was there a basket strainer that got plugged up? We'll get into that a little bit later on here. So, okay. So now let's say, for instance, I can't find that pump tag, but I want to know if my pump's working right. Well, I could take that 70 PSI and I could multiply it by 2.31, and that would give me that 165 feet of head. But I would have to go find out exactly what that pump was supposed to do. Okay, so somewhere in your facility, perhaps you've got a file on pump XYZ1234 that says, hey, you know what, this thing was this thing is supposed to be only doing 130 feet ahead, but yet I've got 70 PSI on my gauge. So this is where you have to typically, on a, on a good application of a pump installation, you're actually going to end up with a, uh, a pressure gauge on the discharge side and a pressure gauge on the suction side. Because yes, you can have pressure on the suction side. So typically what I tell people is, is you can take the pressure on the suction side and either add or subtract it. If it's a negative number, if it's less than atmospheric, it's going to show up as a negative pressure and then you got to subtract it. Or if it's being fed by another system, maybe perhaps I got five stories of water standing on top of that pipe, that's actually going to change the incoming pressure on that pump. So you need to know what the outlet pressure is and you need to know what the inlet pressure is. And by the way, that needs to be measured right at the outlet of the pump and right at the inlet of the pump because things in your system beyond that pump can cause the pressure to read erroneously, okay? And I'll explain that a little bit later on as we go along. So, to find my pressure, if you look at this pump tag here on the right-hand side of the picture with the pressure gauge sitting on top of it there, you see it's one of these nice pump tags that says flow serve on it, and uh, not plugging flow serve or anything, this just happened to be a really nice pump tag that I was able to pull out of there. Um, there's a lot of good information on this pump tag. Uh, should you desire to have to figure out if you need parts for it, it tells you what the bearings are inside the pump. It tells you what the, uh, the customer item, the customer order number, which I have blanked out, the serial number, the type of pump, the size of pump. And you'll notice on the right-hand column, it says 307 gallons per minute at 184.7 PSI. Well, I don't get really nervous about the 0.7. This pumps will actually vary somewhat while they're operating based on temperature. So if the fluid temperature changes, it's going to kind of throw off your head a little bit because the density of the water is going to change as we change the temperature. But I always tell people, take that 184 feet ahead, Divide it by 2.31. You know, in an exact world, I get 79.65 pounds per square inch. Um, as you're looking at that number, I always tell people, don't get excited if that pressure gauge reads 75, 74, 83, 85. You're somewhere in the range of what that pump was designed to be operating on. Because if we're trying to figure out if there's something wrong with the pump, this will tell us that we're kind of like right there in the ballpark. Okay, and uh, like I said, this is kind of uh, old-fashioned science. In fact, this type, this technology has been around forever. This uh, feet of head dates way back to the 1800s. So, anyway, uh, I wish I could throw out there and say any questions so far, but it'd be kind of crazy if all a couple hundred of you decided to ask a question at once. So, kind of. Think about this and we'll see where we're going with this. Now, if I'm doing this pump, now, you see there in the bottom of the page, it says the service is 
some type of a re reformate splitter reflux pump. Um, if I was a betting man, I would probably say this pump is probably a tag off of something uh, you would find at a uh, refinery. So that's probably going to be pumping some type of a uh, a refined petroleum product. So its specific gravity is going to mess with that pressure setting. Okay. So if we're trying to figure out exactly where that pressure lies, we're going to have to know what this reformate splitter uh, fluid is that we're pumping because now, as you see in the formula down below there, pressure equals head divided by 2.31 divided by specific gravity. So that would throw my pressure gauge to a different world. <clears throat> Excuse me. So as we go along a little more, breaking down the hydraulics of the pump, flow rate's the volume of fluid that passes per unit of time. The flow rate is given as how much water can be moved, and it's typically in gallons per minute. On uh, every single pump, no matter how old it is or how new it is, um, flow rate and pump head are the two most important specs that you're going to get in there. Because if you get into that and start looking at it, that's really what the pump is doing. That's going to tell the end user, it's going to tell the technician, it's going to tell the engineer, it's going to tell the designer exactly what this pump's capable of doing. So it's kind of important to understand the flow rate. So is your pump working? Good question. Yes, great, okay. No, oh, now what do I do? Is it really time to panic? Well, no, it's really not time to panic if you think about it. Um, you've still got something to salvage there in front of you. You just have to do a little more research. So I always tell people one of the other things, pieces of information that are very valuable to the pump is going to be my pump curve. And everybody goes, oh, yeah, you know, I heard about that mysterious little piece of paper, but I have no idea what it is or how to read it. So that's okay. There's a lot of people out there that don't understand the pump curve. Uh, I know a lot of engineers that can't understand, uh, understand a pump curve. They've seen them. They don't understand them. But as you're looking at this example on the right-hand side, this was a pump curve that I generated. I took a picture of it and said, hey, this looks pretty good. Uh, so I threw it into the program. I figured, oh, we can talk about this. Um, off the top of my head, I don't exactly remember whose pump this is. But I can tell you that the maximum pump impeller that fits this pump is 12.875. And the minimum impeller that fits this pump volute is 9.375. But my requirements in that system is how I asked for this pump is that it was 120 feet ahead at 800 gallons per minute. Uh, you see that little right angle red right there in the picture? That little right angle red thing in the pump curve is what we call the umlaut. Don't ask me where that name came from. That's the one guy that taught me everything I needed to know about pump curves but was afraid to ask, told me that's the umlaut. That's where your pump's supposed to operate at. Now, I can also point out a few other things in this picture or this slide. Um, you'll notice these little green ISO bars or whatever. You know, if you were looking at a weather map, the, the weather forecast will say the ISO bars. Well, these are lines of efficiency, okay? And these lines of efficiency come into play when we're trying to diagnose problems with a pump. So keeping that in mind, you'll notice there's a couple more things on this pump curve. You notice that the 200 gallon per minute line, I've got this big red line hanging out here. Um, you don't ever want to operate your pump to the left of the big red line, okay? This pump could operate all the way over to here. I could get, oh, somewhere in the near neighborhood of about 140 or 135 gallons or uh, feet of head at, uh, say, uh, maybe 350 gallons per minute, 300 gallons per minute. So I would be way down here at this point of the curve if I ran the line up here. 
However, if I ran that pump at this point, um, you're probably going to find this pump's going to be a troublemaker. And when I talk about a troublemaker, uh, you could poll these questions. It's really hilarious when you start listening to it. Um, I've had people in the class tell me, well, you know, we've got all these pumps in a room and we're changing these seals every year because they're always leaking. And then you'll see somebody else in that same room and that when we're talking about pumps and they'll say, well, that's kind of funny. I've got a pump that's 30 years old and we've never changed the seal on it. And so people start scratching their heads and they say, well, why am I changing seals on this pump so often when this guy's got almost the same pump and almost the same application and I'm not replacing seals. So the question comes in, this is where the pump curve will tell you what's going on. The pump curve is going to say, hey, if you operate too far to the right or too far to the left, you start throwing things at your pump that it's not designed to handle. And typically those are pressures that show up as vibration. And those vibrations will actually show up as something you can measure. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, other good information on this pump is like, okay, so maybe Joe in the facilities group says, hey, um, this pump we got in the system, I need to be able to get a little more gallons per minute out of it. So when you pull that little curve out, you say, okay, can I run this pump at a few more gallons per minute? So the next question would be is how much more do I want to run it? Okay. So Joe comes back and says, oh, you know, I only need a couple hundred more gallons a minute. So that's taking this curve right here to this thousand gallon mark. Okay. And looking at that thousand gallon mark, uh, as you see where the, the curve intersects it at that thousand gallons, I'm going to probably be down to about maybe 110 or 108 feet of head. Uh, so the question has to be answered, will this affect the pump operation? Um, as, a, as a betting man, I'd say no, because it's not that far outside of the bars. Okay, You see you're still running between 80 and 76% efficiency. So that's not bad enough to call, call out an alarm on anything. So you could go back to your... Your engineer say, yeah, we can boost the system up to there. So how are we going to do that? Well, you're going to have to take some elevation plumbing out of there. You're going to have to take some restrictions out of there. You might have to upsize a pipe. These are all things that you look at down the line later. But I do want to point out on this pump curve, you'll notice there's a thing over here on the left-hand side that says NPSHR. That's the blue line that kind of rises as you go to to the right of the curve. One has to be careful there because as you go to the right of the curve on there, your net positive suction head required goes up. And at certain points on this chart, physically the pump will handle it, but gravity wise and the physics wise, you might cause the pump to cavitate when you go to the right hand side of the curve. Okay, there's two types of cavitation that'll show up in my pump. There's called um, NPSH cavitation, and there's uh, a bunch of other things that go along with that. that. You got your NPSH cavitation, and you also have your high head cavitation. So there's certain portions that pop in there. So cavitation is another one of those subjects that we talk about. Um, is my pump cavitating when you're working on the pump? So it's a pretty obvious thing. It just kind of hangs out there and starts making all kinds of racket. So. The other thing you have to be careful of when I boost that flow rate from 800 to 1,000 gallons a minute is do I have enough horsepower? If you've got a 25, well, I'm screwing on this picture here. Take a little closer look. If you're looking at this pump curve, you see at 1,000 gallons a minute, I'm probably at a 30 horsepower driver. But if I should happen to go past 1,000 gallons per minute, I'm going to exceed that 30 horsepower threshold. So I could have problems, oops, sorry. I could have problems with that pump on overloads if I only have a 30 horsepower driver on it. So those are things to consider. So let's take some time and go ahead and troubleshoot our pump now, all right? So what you're looking at right here is a head and flow curve, okay? And this head and flow curve, Put together this is my this is what my impeller is capable of doing the solid black line 
okay? And the best efficiency point you see here pops up in, with the orange line with air on it. That's the point where if I stay close to that point, that's the pump that's not gonna give you problems. You're not gonna have problems with it. In fact, you'll probably go walking out in the facility to make sure somebody hasn't, hasn't removed it from the plant because it hasn't given you any problems. So I always tell that one as a joke too, because I hear people say, yeah, I got this pump. It's not giving me a lick of problems in 20 years. I have to walk by it every once in a while just to make sure it's still there. So those are kind of those funny, funny parts. Now, that little purple line that popped up in there, that's my minimum flow limit. That's the point of no return. Um, if I try to operate that pump to that portion of the curve, I'm going to get high temperature on my fluid. I'm actually going to be putting heat into my fluid, and I'm going to get what's called low flow cavitation. So once that fluid stops moving in that pump, the impeller starts to beat the fluid to death. So if you can imagine that the fluid's not moving, but I'm beating the impeller to death. You'll also notice as we go to the left of that best efficiency point, we see this what's called discharge recirculation. That's where the water decides it wants to go for another ride through the merry-go-round impeller, and it decides it likes that better than it does going anyplace else in the system. So a certain percentage of that water is actually going to hang out and be pump. It's never going to come out. Um, when you go even lower, you start getting into what's called suction recirculation. I might have a, 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 a typical installation where the supply fluid is uh, above the center line of the pump, pump, what we call flooded suction. Um, you'll get some suction recirculation going on there. And then, obviously, when you start doing that, you're going to get low impeller life out of it. You see that there on the bottom. Low impeller life occurs because we've got this suction recirculation, you got discharge recirculation, you got low flow cavitation. All these things are going to take its toll on the impeller over a period of time. So that's being said, what can typically happen to you when you go to the left of the curve? You go to the right of the curve, you notice we kind of get the same thing. Down here on the first thing you're going to hit is low seal and bearing life. On the left hand side of the curve, you get low seal and bearing life. But one thing that you're going to get when you go to the right of the curve, besides the low seal and bearing life, is you get this big word cavitation. Now, if I ask this question, I throw it out there. I wish all of you could answer this. Does everybody know what cavitation is? When I ask that question, the first word out of people's mouth is they go, oh, it's air. No, well, unfortunately, it's not air. It's actually steam. You're boiling that fluid off into a vapor by creating a low pressure area, less than atmospheric, and you hit the point of, you hit the vapor point of the fluid where it changes state from a liquid to a gas. And it's interesting because cavitation bubbles can form inside of a pump, but it's only at one particular point on that curve that the cavitation bubbles become destructive. And to quote some wild and crazy YouTube videos that are hanging out there, Cavitation is an area of low pressure that when it implodes, it focuses an area of pressure the size of about, I like to say roughly the size of the point end of a needle at about 60,000 PSI. And that little point end of a needle actually goes in there and plastically deforms the material. And as any of you have ever played with a ball peen hammer on a piece of metal and just kind of beat on it on a plate, You'll get these little metal flakes that come off of it. That's what cavitation does to your impeller. It's like taking a ball peen hammer and hit a piece of soft steel and you start getting metal flakes off of it. So cavitation is a destructive force. Um, I always tell people, uh, if you want looking at an impeller to look at cavitation damage, it kind of looks like uh, acid erosion or like some, well, I'll, I'll just say little people went after it with a jackhammer. I guess, you know, I always tell people it looks like a midget went after it with a jackhammer. He's a little microscopic sized person. So. so when we look at my percentage of reliability, now I'm going to throw that other little red curve in there, okay? The closer I get to that best efficiency point, the more reliable my pump is going to become. And you notice I can go right or left, so that kind of answers my question. So. Where's a good place I can work, operate this pump at? So the answer to that question is I can operate anywhere between these two zones, left and right, and this pump is going to be a very reliable piece of equipment. 
There you go. I just threw the blue line in there. The blue line is the working point of the impeller. Uh, so this would be zero RPMs. This would be my selected RPMs based on whether I'm running on a VFD or I'm running at a constant speed. So that's always kind of fun. Okay. So when we try to understand what my pump's doing, this is one of my favorite pictures. I don't remember where the heck I got this thing, but I found it from somebody. And everybody can relate to swinging a baseball bat at a ball. And if you've ever stood to the plate and somebody's delivering you a nice, say, well, I don't know if you could get there, but, you know, a major league player getting a 90-mile-an-hour fastball and it happens to hit him on the hands, that's going to hurt. That's going to cause some damage. Um, an operation below this point on the far left-hand side will result in damage. Now, you notice there in that same picture, I got the, uh, the pump curve itself, and I point my best efficiency point right here in what's called the sweet spot of the bat. Now, this area between the end of the handle where your hands go and the beginning of the large portion of the barrel of the bat, you notice in red it says there, vibration levels increased, reduced efficiency, all that kind of fun stuff. Higher maintenance costs. Ooh, there's one of those industrial buzzwords, higher maintenance costs. And if you look down here on the lower portion of this drawing here, you, you see where it says allowable operating region. That's that wide margin. Uh, far to the right and far to the left of the sweet spot. So I like to tell people, hit the ball on the handle, on your knuckles, it hurts. Hit the ball on the tube of the bat, you get a foul ball, pop up, uh, what some major league baseball, call, baseball players call a duck snort, um, all that kind of fun stuff. And then you'll notice as we start to get into that allowable operating region over here, this is my base hit. Uh, this might be my double, this might be my triple, and of course, obviously, if I hit the, on the sweet spot, it's a home run, and then it goes the other way, you know, triple, double, base hit, foul ball. So I guess that's kind of explaining to you in simple ways of how a pump curve works. So, all right, so here's my scenario of the who, what, why, where of pumps. Um, troubleshooting is an art. Troubleshooting is the ability to take in the take in the atmosphere. What's this pump doing? What's this pump not doing? Um, first, you got to identify as the problem. Open loop. You got to find out what type of system it is. Open loop, closed loop. What kind of process? What does it do? Is it making noise? Is it leaking? Are the bearings growling at you? What's the pump not doing? So the art of troubleshooting is being able to walk up to that pump and say, "Hey." What's going on here, okay? So put your hands in your pocket. Uh, what does it smell like? What does it look like, okay? The next thing you gotta do is you gotta find the current pump information. So where do I find that? Is there a pump tag there? Do you have an information file? Does your equipment have an ID number? How is it identified at your location? You need to find that information so you can find that starting point. Are there any maintenance logs you keep on this equipment? Is there any information that was recently added to this main log, maintenance log? Oh yeah, you know, a couple of days ago, Joe was out here looking at this pump because the operator was complaining that it was making noises. He didn't find any problems. So he just said, you know, check on it, no problem found, back to work, okay? All this kind of information can help you zoom in or zero in on what's going on. So once you decide you've got a problem, you need to know if you can isolate the issue. Is it mechanical or is it hydraulic? What's the pump telling you? Uh, sound, sight, smell. Is the pump vibrating? Are the bearings making a noise? Uh, what's interesting out there nowadays is the vibration analyzing world has actually become more economic to the small industrial plant. Um, as you can see in these pictures here, there's a couple different types of vibration analyzers, from the more expensive to the more simplistic. Um, you're going to spend roughly about $500 for a decent handheld vibration analyzer that can tell you, is this thing shaking so far? If it's shaking so far, what's it doing? Um, they give you bearing damage units. They give you bearing G-forces. They give you how much it's shaking in inches per second. Um, all this fun stuff. But the vibration can actually tell you what the pump is doing. So in the picture here, you see this 
uh, 9080. Uh, this is actually quite an interesting little meter. It just popped out on the market about three, four years ago, and it's roughly about $500. So it's kind of a handy little thing. Uh, the 9070 is the $500 meter. This one's a thousand. The 9080 is five, about $1,000, I should say, excuse me. Uh, but the 9070 doesn't do any recording, but it'll do a spot check. So the operator or the mechanic can say, hey, there's something wrong with this pump. So, and then you got that Vibe Expert. That's about a $30,000 tool. And up there in the right-hand side, you got a Fluke 810. That's about a $9,000 tool. And in the picture on the far left, the operator's using a Fluke 805, and that's about a $1,000 tool itself or $1,500. So... But the idea when we're doing with the vibration is if we can actually tell what's going on by the lines of resolution. It tells me if I'm out of alignment, unbalanced, looseness, cavitation will actually show up on the more sophisticated machines um, as a disturbance noise. Bearings when they fail in a pump or bearings when they fail in a motor actually will release a, an acoustical emission that can be uh, measured against the baseline but kind of fun stuff <clears throat> do you guys use um, vibration analyzing for your tools <coughs> excuse me other questions that should be asked when you're walking around with pump problems lubrication do i have to lube my pump do i grease my bearings how much grease do i use do i use too much grease not enough grease What's the configuration of the bearing? Deep groove ball bearing, roller bearings. Some small pumps, your fractional horsepower pumps, don't even have bearings in them. Some small pumps actually use bushings or sleeves. And oil wick the lubrication. Good example of that is the small bell and gosset circulators. They call them three-piece circulators because they got a, they got a little uh, bearing assembly in between there that's basically, um, they're basically babbitted sleeve bearings and you got to, lubricate a little oil wick to keep them oiled. So, And the next question I ask, if I got noise coming from this pump, what's the coupling type? Is the, if it's a closed coupled pump, you don't really have a coupling. Uh, or do I have a motor with a flex, flexible coupling? What's the condition of the coupling? Has the pump coupling been properly aligned? Uh, do I use, when I do alignment, do I just use a straight edge and guess at it? Do I use a dial indicator? Do I have laser? Um, I always tell technicians when they're troubleshooting a pump, take a look around. You got a loose foot. You got a, a loose mounting. Is there a bolt missing? Are there shims laying around under the, under the foot? Those are the obvious things that'll tell you you've got some kind of a vibration going on. Then there's always the hydraulic question. Um, are the valves in the correct position? Are they broken? Are they stuck partially closed? As the fluid process changed, we talk about viscosity, temperature, and chemical composition. Is the pump cavitating? Uh, pump cavitation is very interesting. Pump cavitation, like I said before, being hydraulic. Um, if you can imagine a pump that was absolutely perfectly quiet one minute, and then it sounds like it's trying to pump gravel through it the second minute, that's cavitation. So, look around the pump. Do you see leakage? If so, what's leaking? Oil, pumpage, is the fluid dripping or spraying? Generally speaking, pumps applied to an applica application correctly will perform a long time if they're maintained. Um, don't always assume that the pump was replaced is the same as the original pump. Follow the paper trail. Run into that situation many times where somebody says, oh yeah, we got this pump over here on the shelf and nobody paid any attention and they put a, uh, uh, 500 foot pump in place of a 100 foot pump. And physically, the difference in it could be the RPMs, could be the size of the impeller. So, you know, last but not least, as we're going along here, I'm going to kind of wrap this up real quickly here. I know I've been talking like a crazy man for the last hour or so. I think that's about where we're at here. Right, John? So, I go in there and I say, if you haven't set up a regular maintenance program, now might be a good time. There's a lot of information on the web as you're looking at it. Um, do your homework. Ask a pump professional. Find a reliable pump vendor you can work with. Once you've established a maintenance program for your pumps, keep it up. 
typically it will save you time and money in the long run. And, you know, those are the kind of things that we like to point out when we're doing our classes. And uh, I'd like to take this time to thank you for your time today. Hope you enjoyed this. Like I said, I have a lot of fun talking to people and stuff like that. And understand, we're here to help. We offer a lot of different training courses. Um, I do pumps and pumping systems, kind of a specifying troubleshooting, specifying pump maintenance repair. We also have what's called the troubleshooting rotating mechanical equipment class that we do on the mechanical side. And that talks about bearings, belts, drive sheaths, gearboxes, stuff like that. Understanding and troubleshooting hydraulics. Um, we also do customized programs. You can call the sales department at Trainco to find out about that. You can also find um, upcoming dates and locations at a Trainco website, ppctrainco.com, or you can schedule an on-site training at your facility by uh, sending an email to sales at TPC Trainco. So again, I'd like to thank you, and uh, John's going to take it from here and ask the questions. If you've got any questions hanging out there, feel free to throw them out there now, okay? All right, thanks, Wade. Yeah, it's, uh, as we mentioned uh, before, if you have any questions, there is a little question bar on your GoToWebinar toolbar. Uh, please feel free to type in your question from there, and uh, we'll get through as many of them as we can, uh, trying to be, of course, respectful of your time. Uh, one last thing to add, though, uh, Wade mentioned uh, the on-site training. Um, to further clarify that, an on-site a visit basically is when a TPC Tranco instructor comes out to your site uh, to actually do a customized training for you. And one of the advantages in the pumps world is that uh, the instructor can then take a look at your equipment specifically, tailor the uh, training specifically to your equipment and help you understand any issues or problems that you may be having, again, specific to your equipment. So it's a good benefit. Um, for uh, folks that have a need for an on-site visit. But let's get through some of these questions, Wade. Uh, the first one we have is, can you explain the maximum clearance needed for a submersible comp, uh, pump? It's a little bit uh, off the topic, but if you could uh, go through that briefly, that'd be great. Um, actually, that's really not off the topic. Um, I've run into that question many times. Um, particularly in an application where they're using a multiple stage submersible in a well jacket. Um, we used to get that call a lot. And it's kind of interesting because uh, minimum clearances are actually specified by the individual manufacturers. But typically I tell, tell people, uh, if you've got a four inch diameter submersible pump, you need to put it in at least a six inch casing and you need to have so much water on top of it. Now, as far as a submersible pump that's going to be used to say be thrown in a small location to lift water out of a out of an area where you got a drainage problem, um, that's gonna be based on how many gallons you anticipate because you don't want to run the pit dry. Um, the idea of having the clearance around that pump and motor is you're using that liquid or pumpage to cool that motor to keep it from overheating. So it's important that you have a certain amount and typically I would refer you back to the specifications of the individual manufacturer because it differs from pump to pump. All right. Thanks, Wade. Um, again, want to just remind you, if you need a copy or want a copy of the presentation in a PDF form, uh, you'll receive an email uh, at the conclusion of this webinar. Please just respond to that email and I will get a copy of the PDF out to you um, shortly. Uh, moving on to our next question, on new installations of pumps with moving water, is it code compliance to install a VFD, Wade? Um, no, not particularly. Um, VFDs are typically used in an application like that on, on water for um, if, your, if your pressure or your flow demands in your system vary at point to point during the operational times that you're using the pumps. Um, VFDs are becoming more prevalent in um, heating and air conditioning systems and buildings for circulation pumps for chillers. Um, I used to tell people a long time ago when the earth was green and I was a lot younger, uh, chiller systems and big buildings would have a valve in there. I used to call it the wasting valve because what it does is it wastes a certain amount of fluid back to the other side of the pump again and doesn't send it through the building as the loads on the building change. In other words, as the temperature of the day goes up, 
the requirements to cool the building become greater. And as the temperature goes down, it, it, it goes the opposite way. So keeping that in mind, VFDs are actually becoming the preferred way to control pumps throughout the different types of curves, if you would, or the different load conditions. All right, thanks, Wade. Uh, another question relating to submersible pumps. Have you ever heard of sewer water in a full wet well creating cavitation in a submersible pump? Absolutely. Um, that typically occurs when you've got a problem with, with um, trying to pull too much solids through there. You might find in a submersible, if you don't have something to uh, dice up or slice up the incoming solids, um, it can actually get caught crossways in the inlet area of the volute and cause a low enough flow area to cause the pump to cavitate. So typically it's a mechanical issue where you've got some kind of blockage going on. Thanks, Wade. Uh, do you have a recommendation on how often uh, someone should do maintenance on their pump system? Oh, that's a, ooh, that's a moving target. Um, it all depends on the application, how, how long the pump runs. Does it run 24 hours a day, seven days a week? Does it only run eight hours a day? Does it only run two hours a day? Does it run an hour a week? All those kind of things play into it. Um, a good suggestion is, is go on out there and there's a little book out there that I like to refer people. It's called the Industrial Multi-Craft Mini Reference Book. And that book is um, actually produced by um, Audell, and it's a little handy, I, I call it a desktop information reference guide. Um, it's roughly about $10 to $12 on Amazon, and it's really quite a fascinating little uh, desktop tool that you can use. And it talks about how often I should regrease my pump based on the size of the bearings and how, how long it's running in hours. So, you know, that's one of those loaded questions. All right. Next question is, if my seal water is entering cool and exiting very hot, is my seal water flow rate too slow? And again, that's going to depend on the type of the pump and what type of seal that we're operating with. If you're operating a packed stuffing box, then my suggestion would be is, yeah, you don't have enough flow going on. Um, the other thing that you got to take into consideration is, is what is my pumping and how hot is the fluid that I'm pumping? because that would be an indication that your pumpage or what you're pumping is actually being mixed with your drainage. So that's one of those open questions. It's kind of tough. It's more specific to the application. All right. Uh, next question goes back to the use of VFDs on pumps. Uh, and the uh, asker wants to know, when might it be inappropriate to use a VFD on a pump? Well, uh, if you're using a VFD on a pump and you're only running the pump at, say, set RPMs, uh, in other words, you're using the VFD and you're running it at 1750 or 3500 RPMs, then it's really not being used as a VFD. But if you want to minimize your, um, if you want to minimize your, your voltage dips in your system, um, a VFD can be used to do that as what we call a soft start but you might be wasting your money on a VFD if you never change the speed. All right. Uh, Wade, a couple of questions ago, you mentioned a specific book that was helpful in terms of scheduling a troubleshooting uh, program for you and maintenance program for your pumps. Can you simply uh, restate what the name of that book was again, please? Absolutely. Uh, if you go to Amazon, and I hate, to, I hate to tell this to people, you know, there's particular websites, but if you Google um, the Audel, A-U-D-E-L, Industrial Mini Craft Mini Reference Book. I'm sorry, Multi Craft Mini Reference Book. And the author's Tom Bieber Davis. And if you Google that, you'll find that's a very handy little book. Like I said, it's, I think Amazon has it for like 10 bucks. Um, but it has a lot of those little tiny questions that pop up when you're trying to do work on small pumps and stuff like that and big pumps. So it's kind of a handy little reference guide to tell you when you should do things. The other thing in that uh, website, I mean, sorry, in that uh, presentation, um, a few slides back, I talked about 
uh, lubrication. Uh, the website that's um, operated by a company called Norea, they specialize in machinery lubrication. That machinerylubrication.com has got a lot of little YouTube videos out there to tell you how you should do things. And uh, that's going all the way back to slide 16. I have it highlighted in red there. Um, you can actually go to that machinerylubrication.com website and you can actually sign up for their monthly periodicals and you can get um, daily or semi-weekly little blurps from them about how you should do things and stuff like that. It's a pretty handy little website. All right. Uh, Wade, the next question says, I have a spare water pump. What is the, generally the best way to store it on a shelf? Ooh, that depends on what configuration the, bar the, the pump is. Um, is it a large pump? Does it have sleeve bearing? Does it have regular bearings in it? All those kind of things come into play. Now, that being said, if it's a small pump, fractional horsepower pump, you should probably occasionally two, uh, maybe three times a year, you know, stick your stick a little tool in the in the inlet of it and kind of give it a little spin around and re reestablish the lubricant around the bearings. Um, that pump shouldn't be stored someplace next to other machinery that's vibrating violently or causing the shelf to have a little bit of vibration to it um, because that vibration can cause problems in the pump itself, not so much the, prop, the pump, but in the pump bearings. All right, thanks, Wade. Uh, next question, what should I look for when trying to size centrifugal pumps in parallel? And what about positive displacement pumps in parallel? Well, first of all, uh, positive displacement pump in parallel and positive and non-positive or centrifugal pump in parallel are two completely different animals. If you've got positive displacement pumps in parallel, what you're doing is, is you're matching flow and adding head. So in other words, you're, as your flow requirements change in your system, uh, in other words, I always use the example, if you can imagine it, a petroleum refining facility or petroleum dispensary, um, you've got these, well, what we call them, truck racks where they pull the trucks in and fill, fill the tankers up with, with gasoline, diesel fuel, or whatever they're carrying. Um, those will actually have pumps in parallel in the system. And what they do is, is they, they're based on what the demand of the system is. So as the pressure drops in the system, more and more pumps will come on to keep the pressure up in the system so it matches the flow. Um, the only thing, I've never really had a lot of experience with putting positive displacement pumps in parallel. Um, the only time you really want to do that with positive displacement pumps in parallel would be as if you had a very large hydraulic pumping system, not so much for, for pumping water. Uh, my concern there would be is pressure, pressure control on it because positive displacement pumps can generate a lot of pressure real fast where centrifugal pumps won't. All right. Wait, if budget and money are not an issue, do you recommend to simply repair or replace a pump when failure has occurred? That's another one of those wide open questions. It kind of depends. A lot of your smaller fractional horsepower pumps, manufacturers typically walk away from putting parts on the shelf. So let's say, for instance, I've got a, an inch and a half bell and gossip circulating pump, and you know Joe and Jim were taking the thing out of service, and they were pulling it out of the plumbing to do some work on it. They just happened to drop a portion of it and break the volute on the pump. Um, what's surprising is the, the cost of replacing that pump is less than the cost of replacing the part. Um, a lot of, like I say, a lot of the small fractional horsepower pumps that are out there in the market they kind of frown away from doing that. Um, the pump that I use in the train co training course, the little uh, end suction centrifugal belt drive, um, that pump probably has an acquisition cost of about $78. And the bearings in the shaft for that pump are $150. So there comes a time and a place. Now, when you get into the rather larger pumps, uh, you know, you're talking pumps that are three, four, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000 or three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000, the same thing. You're looking at, you have to determine what needs to be repaired on it. Okay. 
uh, wait, we have one more question, uh, and this okay. uh, person wants to know um, if uh, you slash TBC Tranco can do training on D26, also known as decontamination pumps. Do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> <laughs> decontamination pumps are kind of one of those trick bags that I like to refer to as, hmm, I'd have to do a little research on that one. When you say they're D26 decontamination pumps? Yes. I would have to look into that before I could answer that question. Um, I guess it would be depending on their application and that they're certified. Is there some kind of uh, rules and regulations that control the application and operation, those kind of scenarios, that would be something that I would have to research. But if it is a pump and it's not physically dangerous in the position where it's sitting at, I'd say, yeah, we could look at that. All right. Okay, well, that does it. Um, Wade, thank you very much. Everyone on the call, thank you very much. If you have any further questions, just uh, give us a shout and we'll be happy to help you out in any way we can. Thank you so much for attending.